Welcome to the Management 3120's Chapter 3 lecture. This lecture will cover project management and it is based on information coming from the textbook Operations Management, Sustainability, and Supply Chain Management. It's a 12th edition from Heiser, Render, and Munson. We'll get started. First, we're going to go over our learning objectives. In this chapter, we're going to use a Gantt chart for scheduling. We're going to draw an uh, AOA and AON uh, activity on arrow, activity on node uh, networks, uh, complete forward and backward passes for a project, and we're going to determine a critical path. In continuing our learning objectives, we're going to calculate the variance of activity times and we're going to crash a project. Uh, just to let you know, um, this chapter kind of covers a lot of the math associated with uh, project management that you'll uh, get into with scheduling. Um, it's not all encompassing of uh, all the key elements of a project management plan in accordance with the Project Management Institute standards. Um, so this just kind of dabbles a little bit with project management. But um, either way, we're going to uh, get started here. So today's firms face a modern phenomenon, uh, growing project complexity and collapsing product service life cycles. Um, this evolution stems from awareness of the strategic value of time-based competition and a quality mandate for continuous improvement. Now, each new product or service introduction is a unique event, and it's a project. Uh, in addition, projects are a common part of our everyday life. We may be planning a wedding or a surprise party, remodeling a house, or preparing a semester um, class project, um, like a semester long uh, class project, like kind of we'll have some cumulative projects in this course. Um, scheduling projects can be uh, difficult challenges for operations managers, and the stakes in project management are high. You know, cost overruns and unnecessary delays occur due to poor scheduling and poor control. So think about the characteristics that we covered in the previous slide. Now draw your attention to these two examples of projects. So can you identify the importance why either one would require the project to be expertly managed? So think about a construction project, as in our first example on the left. Visualize the importance of each task on the activities list and how each task must be managed in regard to time, cost, quality, and scope. For example, if weather delays the construction of a house, adjustments will be required to ensure the foundation is poured before the roofer shows up to install the roof. If an issue surfaces and presents an unbudgeted cost, adjustments will be, need to be made in cost and possibly quality for adjustments may have to be made to optimize the total budget without sacrificing key activities from being executed. Now, walls will still need to be constructed. You can't have a home without them. However, an unplanned increase in roofing material may result in the project manager revisiting and purchasing mid-grade wood instead of the planned premium wood or offering the customer uh, builder's grade amenities when premium amenities were originally planned. Uh, construction project managers must be creative in the offerings because customers, customers may not have the extra money to deal with the unplanned costs. Never let, nevertheless, the project must go on. In regard to the research project, not uh, now sticking with the scope of the research, uh, not scope, uh, sticking with the scope of the research can allow scope creep and broaden the focus of the research. So um, scope creep is a common term in project management where 
Um, in this case, you'd have a researcher not staying with the uh, task in hand, uh, staying within the scope of their research, and uh, it'll kind of spread their project thin. And this happens quite often as emerging theories uh, surface, uh, causing researchers to follow new findings. The problem is that stretching a focus or a scope affects the time, it affects the quality, and affects the cost of the research. Um, time, quality, and cost are part of what project managers call the iron triangle, wherein you can't affect one without affecting the others. And a trained project manager will know how to mitigate the scope creep and keep the research focused within the scope of the project, ensuring the project is completed on time and within budget. Now projects take, that take uh, months or years to complete are usually developed outside the normal production system. So project organizations within the firm may set up to handle such jobs and are often disbanded when the project is complete. On the other occasions, managers uh, find projects just part of their job. So the project uh, management, actually the management of projects, involves at least three phases, which are depicted in figure 3.1 in the textbook and referenced on this slide. So first we have planning, uh, much like, you know, your management, your intro to management. This is a fundamental process of management. You know, planning, this phase uh, includes goal setting, defining the project, and team organization. Next, you have scheduling. And this phase relates to uh, people, money, and supplies to specific activities and uh, relates activities to each other, kind of um, associates the activities with one another. Um, controlling. Here, the firm uh, monitors resources, costs, quality, and budgets. It also revises or changes plans and shifts resources to meet time and cost demands. So this slide provides an illustration of the three phases with the corresponding activities. Notice the phases are not arranged in a linear fashion, and that's because project manager by nature is a cycle facilitated by an iterative uh, process. So these activities are iterative in uh, nature, meaning that they are ongoing and constantly revisit or re-executed, which is why most projects have an integration technique built into the project plan. Now this slide provides an illustration of some of the activities associated with the planning phase. So here you have like the iron triangle, um, well kind of representative of the iron triangle here. We have the time uh, cost. A lot of times you'll see that um, third section be quality or scope because um, you can't affect one without the other. Or you'll see scope in the center and you'll see quality there at the bottom. And then uh, in the planning uh, part, we're also defining the uh, project. We're developing the work breakdown structure or the WBS. And we are um, identifying the project team and what resources we have to work with. And this uh, slide provides an illustration of some of the activities associated with the scheduling phase. So in scheduling, you're going to be sequencing the activities. Uh, you're going to be assigning people to those activities. Uh, you're going to create scheduled deliverables. You know, th um, these are action items that absolutely need to be coming um, you know, at certain dates to facilitate a uh, successful project completion. And then you're going to have scheduled resources. And this slide provides an illustration of some of the activities associated with the controlling phase. Um, we're going to monitor resources and costs. Uh, we're going to monitor quality. Um, we're going to revise and change the plans as needed. Um, and then we're going to shift resources. Um, many uh, organizations, especially like in construction, you know, um, you know, they could be doing or like a large scale project and um, let's say uh, earth moving equipment, um, or cranes, you know, heavy equipment, um, you know, they're, they're very expensive pieces of equipment and the organization's just not going out and uh, procure more 
So what they do is, is that they integrate the use of those um, heavy equipment pieces into the project plan. And, you know, that same crane or uh, bulldozer that you see working on a project may be needed for another location like the very next day to keep the project or projects on schedule. And this slide illustrates the key deliverables or outcomes from each respective phase. So back to the planning, we have time, cost estimates, we got budgets coming out of the planning, engineering diagrams, cash flow charts, uh, material availability details. And like I said earlier, this is very iterative in nature, this process. You're going to be going back to the planning as things change um, to maybe adjust uh, some of these. So you're constantly revisiting. You know, something else that's not mentioned here, you know, it's especially in the planning and it's and it seems to change throughout the project is the uh, stakeholder management plan. So um, a lot of this gets done with your key stakeholders. Um, scheduling, that's where you're uh, doing your uh, critical path, your PERT, uh, your Gantt charts, milestone charts, and cash flow schedules. And then finally in uh, the controlling, you're back to budgets because, you know, the money's constantly changing. And then uh, any delayed activities reported or slack activities reported, um, you're either going to make, uh, a, you know, additional adjustments to the schedule. You're going to add time to activities. You may take away time for activities. Activities on the critical path may change um, because of the lack of slack available um, or um, all of a sudden slack appears. Um, and we'll go over slack in a little bit, but uh, that's essentially it. So, so the slide identifies typical uh, steps uh, involved in project planning. Okay, you have a work breakdown structure, which is known as the, uh, you know, WBS. Um, it, it defines the project by dividing it up into uh, major subcomponents or tasks, which are then subdivided into more detailed components. And finally, into a set of activities and their related costs. And this slide uh, identifies typical characteristics of a project organization, which is a an organization formed to ensure that programs, projects, uh, receive the proper management and attention. A project organization often often crosses. Uh, department lines. Um, we talked about functional departments in last chapter. Uh, that's it. It's uh, projects highly cross-functional. So the project manager's job is often high profile and the project success or failure is usually ultimately attributed to that person in a very public way, um, at least within the company. So firms managing multiple projects on a regular basis may set up a matrix organization and you should have learned of the matrix organization. It's more of an organizational culture that's uh, highly agile. So you have different representatives from different functional uh, departments kind of operating. And it's popular with, uh, you know, organizations that have um, that work a lot of projects or spread geographically um, where they need uh, members from different respective uh, functional areas all working together. Um, so very, like I said, very agile, um, and it's to combat like some of the problems that um, they've seen with hierarchical cultures. So all this is coming from your intro class on uh, the matrix organization. So the project projectized organization or matrix organization, um, you know, as you, they are becoming more popular as organizations face complexities associated with the contemporary challenges. Um, and I just mentioned the agility being one of them. Um, the turbulence of the forces of change um, kind of demands more of a matrix uh, culture, if you will, uh, where, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, make phone calls necessarily to different functional departments or email functional departments to get things done. It's like everybody's kind of working in concert with one another. The functional departments are all at the same table in the matrix organization. Um, so, and uh, they're not spread geographically either. It's just, you know, you may have a uh, 
sub-organization that'll have all the different components um, from each function you know, within, within that sub-organization. So it's a highly agile culture and very popular now. You know, this slide uh, lists the circumstances wherein a projectized culture can uh, optimize organizational efforts. So work can be defined with a specific goal and deadline. The job is unique or somewhat unfamiliar to the existing organization. Um, the work contains complex interrelated tasks requiring specialized skills. And the project is temporary but critical to the organization. And the project cuts across organizational lines. So an example of a project organization is shown here in figure 3.2 on this slide. So project team members are temporarily assigned to a project and report to a project manager. The manager heading the project coordinates activities with other departments and reports directly to top management. So number one, project managers receive a high visibility in a firm and are responsible for making sure that all necessary activities are finished in proper sequence and on time. And two, the project comes in within budget. Very important. Three, the project meets its quality goals. And four, the people assigned to the project receive the motivation, direction, and the information needed to do their jobs. This means that project managers should be good coaches and communicators and be uh, able to organize activities from a variety of disciplines. And this slide provides an example of a matrix organization. The matrix structure assigns specialists from um, different functional departments to work on projects being led by a project manager. One unique aspect of this design is that it creates a dual chain of command because employees in a matrix organization have two managers, their functional manager and their product or project manager who share authority. Um, sometimes, you know, it causes a little bit of friction or you may have to engage in a little conflict resolution between the two. Uh, functional managers tend to not want to, like, relinquish the grip of the authority on their department. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, if the uh, project is making the organization a lot of money, the project manager may be able to, uh, you know, uh, use the chain and uh, get the authority that they need. Um, to kind of um, roll over or uh, have authority over the functional manager if need be. So the project manager has the authority over the uh, functional members who are part of his or her project team in areas related to the project goals. However, any decisions about promotions, salary recommendations, and annual reviews typically remain with the functional manager's responsibility. So that's kind of like what I said. They're, they're in charge of the department. But if it comes to the project and decisions need to be made about the project, it's going to be the project manager. And the matrix design um, violates the unity of command principle, which says that each person should report to only one boss. That's that hierarchical chain I talked about earlier. The um, you know with, with researchers and um, you know theorists, uh, consultants even have identified was that that's not an agile uh, culture. So to meet today's demands, we have to go to more of a projectized or matrix uh, layout. So how it, you know it can and does work effectively if both managers communicate regularly and uh, coordinate work demands on employees and resolve conflicts together. So it's in the organization's best interest that they provide a very, very, uh, I would say, uh, cohesive environment for. Um, the project and the functional managers. It's in their best interest. So good project managers need a variety, wide variety of people, organizational and technical skills. So this slide highlights the major responsibilities of a project manager. A good, highly visible project manager ensures that uh, all necessary activities are finished in order and on time. The project comes in on budget. The project meets quality goals, and the people assigned to the project receive motivation, direction, and, and, and information. And continuing with what project managers need to be good, 
uh, project managers need to be good uh, coaches. Remember um, one thing, that there is a human factor side to project management, which is why the human resources management plan within the project plan encompasses techniques to optimize human capital. So project managers tend to be good communicators. That is not uh, limited to uh, being articulate. The project manager usually develops a communications management plan within the project plan for strategic communication across the project continuum. So end project managers need to be able to organize activities from a variety of disciplines. Projects are highly cross-functional, as I said before, in nature, which is why projectized organizations go across the different functional areas of the organization. Now, project managers need to have an understanding of these functional areas as they organize the work breakdown structures, activities lists, um, and certain facets of the project management plan, such as the scope management plan, the time management plan, and the cost management plan. These are all components of the ultimate, um, the overarching uh, project plan. So project managers not only have high visibility, but are also, they also face ethical decisions on a daily basis. How they act establishes the code of conduct for the project. So project managers often deal with, one, offers of gifts from contractors. Uh, two, they um, deal with pressure to alter uh, status reports to mask the uh, reality of delays. Uh, three, um, the uh, false reporting for charges of time and expenses. And four, pressure to compromise quality to meet bonuses and avoid penalties. So think about a lot of organizations, um, there's usually a bonus involved uh, to the project manager if he comes in either uh, early or under, bu under budget. So think about it, if, they, if a, um, a projectized organization that deals with nothing with projects uh, has a, an important project that's very lucrative for the organization and it comes in early, that gives it more time. That gives you more time to work on the next project. Um, more projects, more money. Um, yeah, so, and, or, you know, you come in under budget and the major stakeholders involved uh, will reward you for it. So um, a lot of project managers have uh, bonuses even uh, factored into uh, their agreements with their organizations. So, you know, something like that, you know, can kind of drive um, the project manager to be um, profit driven. Um, instead of adhering to like the organizational value system, you know, as their true north, you know, whatever drives them. So uh, you don't you want to don't want to lose sight of the integration of a value system while working on projects. Um, ethical decision making will be key to keep you out of hot water. So the project management team begins its task well in advance of project execution. Um, so that the plan can be developed. One of its first steps is to carefully establish the project's objectives and then break down the project into manageable parts. So these manageable parts are the components of what is known as the uh, work breakdown structure, the WBS. Now this work breakdown structure, um, we'll also, like I said, see it as WBS. If you see a WBS on a test, that's what we're talking about, um, as it will uh, sometimes be referenced, um, you know, defines the project by dividing it into major subcomponents or tasks, which are then subdivided into more detailed components and finally into a set of activities and their related costs. Okay, so the division of the project into smaller and smaller tasks can be difficult, but it is critical to managing the project and to the scheduling success. Um, gross requirements for uh, uh, people, supplies, and equipment are also estimated in this planning phase. So the work breakdown structure typically decreases the in size from top to bottom, um, as it uh, you know as depicted here in this slide. Uh, so level one, you have your level one. That's usually the project identification. That'll be like the project label, the project name, um, what's the overall project purpose, 
Uh, level two, uh, major tasks in the project. Um, these are your major ones. Uh, so here you have software design, cost management plan, and uh, system testing. Level three are the subtasks that are associated with those major tasks. Um, and then level four are activities or work packages to be completed. Okay, this is where you get to the nitty gritty. Um, so this hierarchical framework can be illustrated with the development of Microsoft's operating systems like Windows 8. Um, as we see in uh, figure 3.3, uh, the project creating a new operating system is labeled 1.0. The first step is to identify the major task in the project level, which is level uh, two entries. And three examples would be the, uh, like I said, the software design as identified in label 1.1, 1 .1, uh, cost management plan as identified in label 1.2, and system testing, which is labeled 1.3. And the two major subtasks for 1.1 are develop, uh, you know, development of a graphical user interfaces or GUIs, and labeled 1.1.1. Uh, and so you see uh, here how everything's labeled and numbered, and creating compatibility with previous versions of Windows as labeled in 1.1.2. And the major subtasks for 1.1.2 are level 4 activities, such as creating a team to handle the compatibility with Windows 7, which is labeled as 1.1.2.1 in the WBS, as well as creating a team for the Windows Vista labeled um, as 1.1.2.2 and creating a team for the Windows XP labeled 1.2.2.3. So there are usually many level four activities as you see here. So this is a pretty good example to go by when you go to start making a WBS. So regardless of which approach is taken by a project manager, project scheduling serves the purpose identified here on this slide. So first it ensures that all activities are planned for, uh, their order of performance is accounted for, and the activity time estimates are recorded. Um, so when you look back at that work breakdown structure, and even when we get into critical path, you'll see where, um, you know, you, you can make a gen generic uh, hypothesis of how long um, a project's going to take shooting from the hip. That's not good enough for your key stakeholders. They're going to want to know when the project's done. That's not good for your organization. They're going to want to know when the project's done. They're going to want to know where, how much money you have to work with at any given point in the uh, project. A lot of times with how much money is remaining, you can uh, kind of extrapolate like how much longer uh, you have on the project or even like when the money's going to run out, um, which is important to know. Um, that's why, uh, you know, all these key variables involved in project management, um, you know, involves a lot of math. Okay, so, and then you have the... Um, overall project time being developed in the scheduling. So project scheduling involves sequencing and allotting time to all project activities. At this stage, managers decide how long each activity will take and compute the resources needed at each uh, stage of production. So managers may also uh, chart separate schedules for personnel needs by uh, type of skill, um, whether it's management, engineering, or pouring concrete, for example, or materials, uh, the material needs. So whatever the approach taken by the project manager, project scheduling serves these several purposes. So first, it shows the relationship of each activity to others and to the whole project. It also identifies the precedence relationships uh, among activities. Uh, it encourages the setting of uh, realistic time and cost estimates for each activity, and it helps make better use of people, money, and material resources by identifying critical bottlenecks in the project. So one popular project scheduling approach is the Gantt chart. Uh, we uh, talked a little bit about Gantt charts in the uh, first chapter. Um, Gantt charts are low-cost means of helping uh, managers make sure that, um, one, 
activities are planned. Two, the order of performance is documented. Three, activity time estimates are recorded. And four, overall project time is developed. So on simple projects, scheduling charts permit uh, managers to observe the progress of each activity and to spot and tackle problems. Now, Gantt charts, though, do not adequately uh, illustrate the interrelationships between activities and resources. Um, so your program evaluation and review techniques, or PERT, is how it's known, um, and critical path method, the two widely used network techniques, do have the ability to consider precedence uh, relationships and interdependency of activities. So again, that's your critical path method, or CPM, or PERT. So on complex projects, the scheduling of which is most always computerized, PERT and the CPM or critical path method uh, thus have an edge over the simpler uh, Gantt charts. So even on huge projects though, Gantt charts can be used as summaries of the uh, project status and may complement the other network approaches. A lot of times when you're meeting with your stakeholders, um, it's these Gantt charts or even like milestone charts. That's what they want to look at. They don't need to know all the nitty gritty. They don't really want to get into all the details. A lot of times it's all about the milestones. Where are we at in the project? Um, what, what's next? What have we successfully completed? What are we still working on? What's the hold up? You know, um, all these can be illustrated with the use of those uh, broad based uh, Gantt charts or milestone charts. And this slide depicts a simple version of a Gantt chart illustrating the broad-based activities uh, starting from January and ending in September. So here you have the design, the prototype, test, revise, and production. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. So you see the layout. As this slide illustrates in figure uh, 3.4, Gantt charts are easy to understand. Horizontal bars are drawn for each project activity along a timeline. So this particular il illustration of a routine servicing of a Delta jetliner during a 40-minute layover shows that Gantt charts also can be used for scheduling repetitive operations. And in this case, the chart helps point out potential delays. So you want to see the operations management in action uh, section of page 66 in the textbook. It's titled Delta's ground crew orchestrates a smooth takeoff. And you'll get some uh, additional insights on this by referencing that. And the control of prog uh, projects involves close monitoring of resources, costs, quality, and budgets. So computerized software programs such as Microsoft Project uh, produce a wide variety of reports and information clean from them, uh, and it helps managers make adjustments. So, you know, project controlling, like I said, it's the close monitoring of the resources, cost, quality, budgets, feedback enables revising the project plan and shift resources, um, and computerized tools uh, produce extensive reports. There are all the control mechanisms. So this slide identifies several popular project management software packages. Um, you have uh, Oracle Primavera, MindView, uh, HP Project, uh, FastTrack, and Microsoft Project, which we'll cover a little later. Um, there's all kinds of software out there for project management. Like I said, they, you know, this chapter really only um, covers a small facet of what project management really is all about. Um, you know, you have uh, numerous parts. Each uh, section of the plan is a plan in itself. And we're just covering um, here with the time and uh, time management we're covering here in this chapter. And we're covering um, the schedule. So those aforementioned programs that we just talked about produce a broad variety of reports, including like a detailed cost breakdown, labor requirements, cost in hour summaries, raw material and expenditure forecasts, 
uh, variance reports, um, very, very important. Where, what are we supposed to be doing? Where are we supposed to be? And where are we actually at? Um, very important for the controlling part. Um, time analysis reports and work status reports. So looking at the variety of reports, these are essential for project managers to make the data-driven decisions they need to make. Now we're back to talking about PERT and the critical path method again, the CPM. They were developed at around the same time and most of their characteristics are the same. So the major differences is that PERT uh, incorporates uh, the uncertainty in task times by employing three time estimates for each activity. You have an optimistic, a pessimistic, and a most likely with PERT. With PERT, uh, project managers can estimate probabilities of completing the project within certain time frames. And this slide uh, presents the first three of six uh, basic steps of PERT or the critical path methodologies. Uh, remember PERT or it's actually the program evaluation and review technique. Okay, remember that's what PERT stands for, uh, Program Evaluation and Review Technique. And that is a project management technique that employs three time estimates for each activity. And the critical path uh, method, or the CPM, is a project management technique that uses only one time factor per activity. So first, it is important to define the project and prepare the work breakdown st structure. Second, it is... Uh, time to develop the relationships among the activities and decide which activities must proceed and which ones must follow others. And third, it is time to draw the network connecting all the activities. The fourth step is to assign time and or cost estimates for each activity. Um, so the fifth step is to compute the longest time path through the network. Uh, this step is referred to as the critical path, okay? Um, you, the longest time, you can have numerous activities fall within the start of the project and the longest time, but the real duration of the project is going to be um, highly associated with um, those activities that present the, like, the longest time, the longest time on it. Um, doesn't matter what's in the middle, you know, your schedule is going to encompass uh, start to finish. Um, so the activities on the critical path, uh, present tasks that will delay the entire project if they are not completed on time. So managers can gain the flexibility needed to complete critical tasks by identifying non-critical activities and replanning, rescheduling, and reallocating labor and financial resources. And finally, the sixth step is to use the network to help plan, schedule, uh, monitor, and control the project. Now, although PERT and the critical path differ in some extent in terminology um, and in the construction of the network, their objectives are pretty much the same. So, uh, you know, the analysis used in both techniques is very similar. Uh, the major difference is that PERT employs three time estimates for each activity. Remember that. PERT employs three time estimates for each activity. Now, these time estimates are used to compute expected values and standard deviations for the activity. So the critical path makes the assumption that activity times are known with certainty and hence requires only one time factor for each activity. So PERT and CPM are important because they can answer questions such as the following about projects with thousands of activities. Now, um, first question would be, you know, is when will the entire project be completed? Uh, that's common, you know. Uh, this needs to be known to meet customer needs, budgetary uh, constraints, and for stakeholders' interests and engagement. You know, next question would be, uh, what are the critical activities or tasks in the projects? You know, that is, which activities will delay the entire project if they were late? And a critical task like obtain required permits seems important. Well, if it's uh, special variances are involved to get those permits, it could delay the project to a degree that construction 
maybe pushed into bad weather months. Um, see how all this connects where, you know, many of your tasks are going to end up being delayed. So now the whole project gets delayed. Um, therefore, you know, it will demand risk management um, as well as Herculean efforts to, in order to plan to ensure that a critical task is accomplished. They're very, very important and not to be ignored um, or taken lightly. Uh, the third entails identifying which are the non-critical activities. And these are the ones that uh, can run late without delaying the, uh, you know, the whole project's completion. Um, the fourth is identifying the probability that the project will be completed by a specific date. Uh, so much is uh, relying on this, therefore it is very, very essential to know. Now, moving on to the fifth question, at any date is the project on schedule behind, um, behind schedule or ahead of schedule? Now, this question corresponds with concerns such as meeting customers uh, and stakeholders' needs, if there is enough money uh, remaining, if there will be enough money remaining at the end, which can foster extra bonuses uh, for the project team. And we uh, discussed that earlier, why uh, it could be good to have money uh, remaining at the end. Uh, the sixth question on any given date is the uh, money spent equal to less than or greater than budgeted amount. Again, answers the same concerns in the project management that you will notice money and time, um, they greatly interconnect with one another. So. The benefits you'll see from, or the concerns you'll see on the money is pretty much the same on time. Time is money when it comes down to project management. And the seventh question is, are there enough resources available to finish the project on time? So are personnel or equipment scheduled to move on to another project? Will another team be hired? Uh, will equipment rentals need to uh, double to finish the project on time? Uh, there is a lot to consider. Um, and the eighth and final question is if the project is to be finished in a shorter amount of time, um, what is, which is the best way to what is the best way to accomplish the goal at the least cost? Okay, um, finishing projects earlier than scheduled with a focus on coming in under a budget is usually the. I'd like to say it's the goal. The goal is to finish the project within in accordance with the project scope, but. A lot of uh, organizations like to push for early finish and under budget as long as the quality is being met. So as long as scope has been met and quality standards are agreed upon, um, you know, early finish means bonuses. That's what it comes down to. It means the ability to take on another project, which means more money for the firm. It means stakeholders are happy, which increases the firm's credibility. Now, the first step in the PERT or the critical path method network is to divide the entire project into significant activities in accordance with the work breakdown structure. Okay, So all this interrelates. It all interconnects. Uh, there are two approaches for drawing a project network. Um, the first one is activity on node and activity on arrow is the second. So AON, when you say AON, that's activity on node, AOA activity on arrow. So under the activity on node uh, convention, uh, nodes designate activities. Under the AOA, um, you know, arrows uh, represent the activities. Okay. Um, activity on node convention, um, nodes designate activities. AOA, the arrows represent activities. So activities um, consume time and resources. So the basic difference between AON and AOA, activity on node and activity on arrow, is that the nodes in an AON, activity on node diagram, represents activities. And the AOA network, activity on arrow network, the nodes represent the starting and the finishing time of an activity and are also uh, called events. So nodes in AOA consume neither time nor resources. Yeah. 
and you can see on this slide, I'm going to leave it up here a little bit. You see how it's spelled out, out, how it's laid out. Activity on node, you have your A to the B to C. A becomes before B, which comes before C. Then then it's laid out in activity on arrow, just like that. And here you have uh, in um, example B, you have A and B must be uh, both be completed before C can start. And then how it's depicted in the activity on arrow. Activity on node, uh, B and C cannot begin until A is completed. That's how it would be represented. Here, you have C and D uh, cannot begin until both A and B are completed. Um, you have activity on node. You can see where the arrow is going for A to both C and D. Because A needs to be um, completed before C or D even start, and the same goes for B. And then you see how it's represented in activity on arrow. And same thing for the next one. C cannot begin until both A and B are completed. D cannot begin until B is completed. And a dummy activity is introduced in uh, AOA. You'll see sometimes uh, dummy activities are added. And it's usually a, it'll be the start of a project or it's just to fill a, um, a space. Same thing here. B and C cannot begin until A is completed. D cannot uh, begin until both B and C are completed. A dummy activity is again introduced in the AOA. So we're going to cover a case involving uh, predecessor relationships for pollution control at Milwaukee Paper. Okay, Milwaukee Paper Manufacturing had a long delayed had long delayed the expense of installing advanced computerized air pollution control equipment in its facility. So we're going to do like a little bit of a case study here, okay? But when the board of directors adopted a new proactive policy on sustainability, it did not just authorize the budget uh, for the state-of-the-art equipment. It directed a plant manager named Julie Ann Williams to complete the installation in time for a major announcement of the policy on Earth Day, which is exactly 16 weeks away. So under the strict deadline from her bosses, Williams needs to be sure that installation of the filtering system progresses smoothly and on time. Now, given the following information, the table on this slide has been developed to show activity precedence relationships. Okay. So here, the Milwaukee paper has identified eight activities that need to be performed for the project to be completed. Now, when the project begins, two activities can be simultaneously started, um, them being building the internal components for the device, which is depicted by activity A, and the modifications necessary for the floor and roof, which is activity B. Now, the construction of the collection stack uh, listed as activity C can begin when the internal components are completed. Now, pouring the concrete floor and installation of the frame listed as activity D can be started as soon as the internal components are completed and the roof and floor have been modified. Now, after the collection stack uh, has been constructed, two activities can begin. Uh, one being building the high temperature burner, which is activity E, and installing the pollution control system, which is activity F. And the air pollution device can be installed, activity G, after the concrete floor has been poured, the frame has been installed, and the high temperature burner have been built. And finally, after the control system and pollution device have been installed, the system can be inspected and tested, which is activity H. So three, table 3.1 on this slide lays out the solution in a descriptive form where, ambigu where ambigu ambiguity 
can demand drawing of the AON activity on node for Milwaukee paper uh, using the data here in table 3.1, which we'll do over the next slides. Okay, so moving on. So in the activity on node approach, um, we denote each activity by a node. The lines or arrows represent precedence relationships between the activities. Now, in this example, there are two activities, A and B, that do not have any predecessors. So we draw separate nodes for each of those activities as shown in figure 3.5 on this slide. Now, although not required, it is usually uh, convenient to have a unique starting activity for the project. So like I said earlier about the dummy activities. Um, so in this case, we use the dummy activity and we have uh, included the uh, activity of start in figure 3.5 right here. And this dummy activity does not really exist and takes up uh, zero time and resources. So activity start is an immediate predecessor for both activities A and B and it serves as the unique starting activity for the entire project. So now we show the precedence relationships using lines with arrow symbols. Now, for example, an arrow from starting uh, start to activity A indicates that start is a predecessor for activity A. In a similar fashion, we draw an arrow uh, from start to B. Next, we add a new node for activity C. Now, because activity A precedes activity C, we draw an arrow from node A to node C, as depicted in this figure, 3.6. Now, likewise, we draw a node to represent activity D. Then, because activities A and B both precede activity D, we draw arrows from A to D and from B to D as depicted here. Now we proceed in this fashion, adding a separate node for each activity and a separate line for each precedence relationship that exists. Okay, the complete activity on node project network for the Milwaukee paper project is shown here in figure 3.7. And as you can see, drawing a project network properly takes some time and experience. We would like the lines to be straight and arrows to move to the right when possible. Now here we drew the complete activity on arrow project network for Milwaukee's paper problem. Uh, papers problem. Uh, we see that the um, activity A starts the event starts at event one and ends at event two. Likewise, uh, activity B starts at event one and ends at event three. And activity C, whose only immediate predecessor is activity A, starts at node two and ends at node four. And activity D, however, has two predecessors, activities A and B. Hence, we need both activities A and B to end up at event three so that activity D can start at, at that event. Now, however, we cannot have multiple activities with common starting and ending nodes in an um, activity on arrow network. So to overcome this difficulty in such cases, we may need to add a dummy line activity to enforce the uh, precedence relationship. Uh, the dummy activity shown in figure 3.8 as a dashed line is inserted between events two and three to make the diagram reflect the precedence between A and D. So the remainder of the activity on Arrow Project Network for Milwaukee's papers example is also shown. So this slide describes characteristics of critical path analysis. Looking back at the previous slides on the Milwaukee case study, let's assume that um, Milwaukee paper estimates the time required for each activity in weeks, as shown in, ta in table 3.2. And the table indicates that the total time for all the eight, all eight of the company's activities in, is 25 weeks. However, because several activities can take place simultaneously, 
it is clear that the total project completion time may be less than uh, 25 weeks. So to find out just how long the project will take, we will perform a critical path analysis for the network. So this slide contains the time estimates for Milwaukee, uh, you know, for the Milwaukee paper example that will be used to illustrate the critical path analysis, which we will be covering uh, re, uh, momentarily. Uh, so note that the project will take less than 25 weeks to complete because some of the activities will be performed simultaneously. And as mentioned earlier, the critical path is the longest time path through the network. So to find the critical path, we calculate two distinct uh, starting and ending times for each activity. Now, these are defined as follows. So early start, or represented by ES here, is the earliest time at which an activity can start, assuming that all predecessors have been completed. Um, early finish is the earliest time at which an activity can be finished. And then you have late start, um, you know, shown as LS, and is the latest time at which an activity can start um, without delaying the completion time of the entire project. Um, and this is like an example like where you have, uh, you know, you have an end date to the project, right? And you're going to start, um, you know, two activities simultaneously and one maybe doesn't have to be simultaneously um, I should take that back um, you can actually hold up the start time on one because of the length of time that maybe another one that's going to run almost concurrently uh, will take so um, that's when that comes into handy uh, knowing when, what you can delay and what you can't um, so again, like late start is the latest time at which an activity can start without delaying the completion time of the entire project. And then you have the latest finish, um, which is represented by LF, which is the latest time by which an activity has to finish so as to not delay the completion time of the entire project. So we use a uh, two-pass process consisting of a forward pass and a backward pass. This is not football. Um, this is project management. Um, so, and the forward pass and backward pass determine these time schedules for each activity. So, the early start and early finish times, ES and EF, are determined during the forward pass. And the late start and late finish times, uh, LS and LF, are determined during the backward pass. So, moving on. So to clearly show the activity schedules on the uh, project net, project network, we uh, use the notion, notation shown here um, in figure 3.9. Um, the early start, or ES, of an activity is shown in the top left corner of the node uh, denoting that activity. Okay, activity A. We have early start. Early finish is over on the right. Uh, also known EF. The latest times, late start and late finish, are shown on the bottom left and right respectively. So you see them there. And then you have the total activity duration right down there in the center. So this slide covers the earliest start time rule. Before an activity can start, all its immediate uh, predecessors must be finished. Um, if an activity has only a single immediate uh, predecessor, its uh, early start equals uh, early finish of the predecessor. So if an activity has multiple immediate predecessors, its early start is the maximum of all early finish values of its predecessor. That is, early start equals early finish of all immediate predecessors. And this slide covers the earliest uh, finish time rule. The earliest finish time EF of an activity is the sum of its earliest start time and its activity time. That is EF early finish equals early start 
plus activity time. And because activity start has no predecessors, we begin by setting its e early start to zero. That is, activity start can begin at time zero, which is the same as beginning of week one. If the activity start has an early start of zero, its early finish is also zero, since the activity time is zero. Next, we consider activities A and B, both of which have only a um, start as an immediate predecessor. Uh, using the earliest start time rule, the, um, the early start for both activities A and B equals zero, which is the early finish of activity start. See that? Early finish of activity start. Um, now, using the earliest finish time rule, the early finish for activity uh, A is 2, which derives from 0 plus 2. So, early finish of A is the early start of A, which is 0 plus 2, which is the duration. And the uh, moving on to B, I'm going to backtrack here. We just went to A. So next we consider activities A and B, both of which have uh, only start as an immediate. Um, predecessor, uh, so using the earliest start uh, time rule, the S for both activities A and B uh, equals zero, which is the early finish of activity start. Now using the earliest finish time rule, the uh, early finish for A is two, uh, which derives from zero plus two, and the early finish for B is three, which derives from 0 plus 3. So you do the same thing for B. Now since activity A precedes activity C, the early start of C equals the early finish of A, which equals 2. Now the early finish of C is therefore 4, which derives from 2 plus 2. Since the activity A precedes activity C, the early start of C equals the early finish of A, which is 2. The early finish of C is therefore 4, which derives from 2 plus 2. Now we come to activity D. Now, both activities A and B are immediate predecessors for D, whereas A has an early finish of 2, and activity B has an early finish of 3. So, using the earliest start time rule, we compute the early start time as, of activity D as follow. So, um, so, early start of D equals the max. Uh, which is the early finish of A or the early finish of B. So the max being uh, 2 or 3, okay, um, you're going to go with 3. So the early finish as the early start of uh, the early start of D is 3 because you're using the max. Which one was higher out of the uh, 2 or the 3? Okay, so you just bring that over to the early uh, start of uh, D. Now, the early finish of D equals 7, and that derives from 3 
plus 4, which is the duration. And so you have early start, duration, and then early finish is 7. Now, next, both activities E and F have activity C has, as their only immediate uh, predecessor. Therefore, um, the early start for both E and F equals 4, which derives from early finish of C. Okay? The early finish of E is 8, which derives from 4 plus 4, and the early finish of F is 7, which derives from 4 plus 3. Now, activity G has both activities D and E as predecessors. So, using the earliest start time rule, its early start time is therefore the maximum of the early finish of D and the early finish of E. Hence, the early start of activity G equals 8 which derives from the maximum out of uh, num of 7 and 8. And its early finish equals 13, which derives from 8 plus 5. And finally, we come to activity H, because it also has two predecessors, being F and G. So the early start of H is the maximum early finish of these two activities. That is... The early start of H equals 13, which derives from the maximum of 13 and 7. Um, this implies that the early finish of H is 15, which derives from 13 plus 2. And because H is the last activity of the project, it also implies that the earliest time in which the entire project can be completed is 15 weeks. See how that's done? Now remember, the early start of an activity that has only one predecessor is simply the early finish of that predecessor. Now for an activity with more than one predecessor, we must carefully examine the early finishes of all immediate predecessors and choose the largest one. That's the maximum. Now, although the forward pass allows us to determine the earliest project completion time, it does not identify the critical path. To identify this path, we need to now conduct the backward pass to determine the late start, um, or the LS, as it will be uh, depicted uh, or represented, and the late finish, or the LF, uh, values for all the activities. So just as the forward pass began with the first activity on the project, the backward pass begins with the last activity of the project. Now for each activity, we first determine its uh, late finish value, uh, followed by its late start value. So the following two rules are used in this process. So late finish uh, time rule is based on the fact that before an activity can start, all its immediate predecessors must be finished. Now, if an activity is an immediate predecessor for just a single activity, its late finish re equals the late start of the activity uh, that immediately follows it. So, if an activity is an immediate predecessor for just a single activity, its late finish equals the late start of the activity that immediately follows it. Now, if an activity is an immediate predecessor to more than one activity, its late start is the minimum of the late start values of all activities that immediately follow it. So that is, late finish equals the minimum, which is late start of all immediate following activities. Now, the latest start time rule is the latest start time, LS, of an activity is the difference of its latest finish time and its activity time. So that is late start 
equals late finish minus the activity time. Again, the late start of an activity is the late finish minus the activity time. So now we're going to calculate the latest start and finish times for each activity in the Milwaukee Papers Pollution Project. So we're going to use figure 310 as a beginning point. Now you should follow along on page 74 in your textbook. Overlay 1 of figure 3.10. You'll see overlays in your textbook. Um, that shows the complete project uh, network for the Milwaukee Paper along with the added late start and late finish values for all activities. In what follows, we will see how these values were calculated. So we begin with assigning a uh, late finish value of 15 uh, weeks for activity H. That is, we specify that the late, latest finish time for the entire project is the same as the earliest finish time. Now, using the latest start time rule, the late start of activity H is equal to 13, which derives from the late finish minus 2, which is the project, or which is the activity duration, and then that gets you 13. Now, because activity H is the loan succeeding activity for both activities F and G, the late finish for both F and G equals 13. Now this implies that the late start of G is H, which derives from the 13 minus 5, which is the activity duration, and the late start of F is 10, which derives from 13, which is the late finish, minus the um, activity duration, 13 minus 3. Now, proceeding in this fashion, we will see that the late finish of E is 8, which derives from I'm sorry, I was looking at the uh, slide there. Um, e is 8, which derives from the late start of G, and its early, uh, late start is 4, and that derives from 8 minus 4. Now, likewise, the late finish of D is 8, which derives from late start of G, and its late start is 4, which derives from 8 minus 4. Now, we now consider activity C, which is an immediate predecessor to two activities, E and F. So using the late, latest finish time rule, we compute the late finish of activity C as follows. So late finish of C equals the minimum which derives from the late start of E and the late start of F, the minimum out of the 4 and 10 is 4. That's the minimum. Okay, where before with the forward pass it was different. We were going maximum. So now we're using minimum. And 4 is less than 10. The late start of C is computed as 2, which derives from 4 minus 2. Next, we will compute the late finish of B as 4, which derives from the late start of D, and its uh, late start is 1, which derives from 4 minus 3. So now we consider uh, activity A. Now we can compute its late finish as 2, which derives from um, the minimum of late start of C, and the late start of D. Now, hence, the late start of activity A is 0, which derives from 2 minus 2. Finally, both the late finish and late start of activity start are equal to 0. So, the late finish of an activity 
that is the predecessor of only one activity is just the late start of that following activity. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The late finish of an activity that is the predecessor of only one activity is just the late start of that following activity. So if the activity is the predecessor to more than one activity, its late finish is the smallest uh, late start value of all the activities that follow immediately. So after we have computed the earliest and the latest times for all activities, it is a simple matter to find out the amount of slack time that each activity has. Now slack is the length of time an activity can be delayed without delaying the entire project. Okay, so it is also known as free time for an activity or referred to as free float or free slack. So mathematically slack equals the late start minus the early start or slack, slack equals late finish minus early finish. So I'll leave that here so you can write that formula down. Late start minus early start, or late finish minus early finish. So now we're going to go and um, calculate the slack for the activities in the Milwaukee paper project. So we'll start with the data in overlay one of figure 3.10 in the text um, in example five and develop table 3.3. .3 uh, one line at a time. So looking here at table 3.3, it summarizes the early start, early finish, late start, late, late finish, and slack time for all the firm's activities. So activity B, for example, has one week of slack time because its late start is one and its early start is zero. So alternatively, its late finish is 4 and its early finish is 3. So either one of them, uh, when you do your subtraction, gives you 1. Now this means that activity B can be delayed by up to one week and the whole project can still be finished in 15 weeks. Now, on the other hand, activity C, E, and G, as you see here, and H have no slack time. That means that none of them can be delayed without delaying the entire project. Now conversely, if the plant manager, Julie Ann Williams, wants to reduce the total project time, she will have to reduce the length of one of these activities. So overlay two of figure three, um, 310 in the textbook shows the slack computed for each activity. So slack may be computed from uh, from either early late starts or early late finishes. The key is to find which activities have zero slack. So activities with zero slack on the critical path, it starts with the first activity in the project, terminates at the last activity in the project, and includes only critical activities. Now the activities with zero slack are marked as being on the critical path, and the path is identified on this slide depicting activities A, C, E, G, and H, which have no slack. Now this slide presents a Gantt chart for the earliest start and finish times, working on each step as soon as possible. And this slide represents um, the latest start and finish times, uh, more like what is known as uh, a just-in-time approach. Um, just-in-time is actually a... Uh, 
a formal term in project management. So it's represented here on uh, the latest start time and finish times. And in identifying all earliest and latest times so far and the associated critical paths, we have adopted the critical, critical path method, the CPM approach of assuming that all activity times are known and fixed constraints. That is, there are no variability uh, in activity times. Uh, however, in practice, it is likely that activity completion times vary depending on various factors. Now, for example, bu building internal components, which was represented by activity A for Milwaukee paper manufacturing, is estimated to finish in two weeks. Now, clearly, the supply chain issues, such as uh, late arrival of materials, absence of key personnel, and so on, could delay this activity. So, suppose activity A actually ends up taking three weeks. Now, because a activity A is on the uh, critical path, um, the entire project um, will now be delayed by one week to 16 weeks. So if we had anticipated uh, completion of this project in 15 weeks, we would obviously miss our Earth Day deadline. So although some of the activities may be relatively less prone to delays, others could be extremely susceptible to delays. For example, like Activity B, uh, Modify Roof or Floor, could be heavily dependent on weather conditions. A spell of bad weather could significantly affect the uh, completion time. The PERT uh, process or PERT methodology introduces the uh, common occurrence of activity time uncertainty, which may be particularly uh, applicable for a new project incorporating new activities or personnel. So we cannot ignore the impact of variability in activity times when deciding the project uh, the schedule for the project. So the PERT addresses this issue. Now in PERT, we employ a probability distribution based on three time estimates uh, for each activity as follows. So first we uh, look at the optimistic time. That's represented by a lowercase a. And this is the time an activity will take if everything goes as planned. In estimating this value, there should be only one a only a small probability, say one in a hundred, that that activity time will be under the projected time. Okay, um, optimistic time is the best activity completion time that could be obtained in a PERT network. Um, and then you have the pessimistic time, which is represented by a lowercase b, and this is the time an activity will take. Uh, assuming very unfavorable conditions. So in estimating this value, there should only be a small probability, uh, also one in a hundred, that the activity time will be greater uh, than the projected time. So pessimistic uh, or less than, uh, you know, the, uh, the projected time. So the pessimistic time is the worst time that can be expected in a uh, PERT network. And then you have the most likely time, and this is represented by a lowercase m, and this is the most realistic estimated time required to complete a activity. So most likely uh, time is the most uh, probable time to complete an activity in a PERT network. So optimistic if everything goes according to plan, pessimistic uh, assuming very unfavorable conditions, and most likely time. That's the most realistic. So when using PERT, we often assume that activity time estimates follow the beta probability distribution. Now this continuous distribution is often appropriate for determining the expected value and variance for activity completion times. So as represented in this formula, the, to find the expected activity time represented by 1, the beta distribution weights um, the three time estimates as t or time equals optimistic time or a plus four times the most likely time plus the pessimistic time uh, divided by six. 
that is the most likely time m is given four times the weight as the optimistic time and the pessimistic time um, and the time estimate which is t computed uh, is computed using this equation um, three minus six for each activity um, No, three dash six is the uh, is the equation. Now, for each activity is used in the project network to compute all earliest and latest times. So, to compute the dispersion or variance of activity completion time, we use the formula variance equals pessimistic time, or B minus the optimistic time. Um, or A, and it's divided by 6 squared. It's divided by 6 and then squared. We'll leave this formula up there for you. So this slide reminds us that the optimistic and the pessimistic times should be chosen such that there are um, there should only be about a one percent chance of the activity actually taking shorter than long or shorter than or longer than um, those two times respectively. And this slide applies to the ongoing Milwaukee's paper example. Uh, computing an expected time and variance for each activity. Notice that the expected times are different from the most likely uh, times and when they are the same. So notice when they are different and when they are the same. Now also notice that the size of the variance is directly related to the spread between the optimistic and the pessimistic times and has nothing to do with the most likely time. And this slide presents the formula for the variance of the entire project. So by assuming that the activities are interdependent, uh, this value is simply the sum of the individual activities on the critical path. So in reality, the um, independence assumption may well not apply, or and importantly, um, ignoring the variance of non-critical activities may underestimate the true project variance. So this illustration uh, computes the project variance for the ongoing Milwaukee paper example. So because activities are interdependent, we can add the variances of the activities on the critical path and then take the square root to determine the project standard deviation. So from example 8, uh, table 3-4, we have the variances of all the activities on the critical path. Now specifically, we know that the variance of activity A is 0.11. Um, the variance of activity C is 0.11. And the variance of activity E is 1.0. The variance of activity G is 1.78. And the variance of activity H is 0 0.11. So now we'll compute. So project variance equals 0.11 plus 0.11 plus 1.00 plus 1.78 plus 0 0.11 which equals 3.11 which implies project standard deviation the square root of project variance equals square root of 3.11 which is 1.76 weeks. 
So management now has an estimate uh, not only of expected completion time for the project, but also of the standard deviation of that estimate. So how can this information be used to help answer questions regarding the probability of finishing the project on time? Uh, PERT makes two assumptions. First, the total project uh, completion times follow a normal probability distribution. And two, activity times are statistically independent. Now, with these assumptions, the bell-shaped uh, normal curve shown here in figure 3.12 can be used to represent uh, project completion dates. The normal curve implies that there is a 50% um, chance um, that, one, that the uh, manufacturer's project completion time will be less than 15 weeks and a 50% chance that it will exceed 15 weeks, not too assuring on either end, right? Right smack in the middle. So in continuing with the Milwaukee paper, uh, Julianne Williams would like to find the probability that her project will be finished on or before the 16-week deadline. So to do so, she needs to determine the appropriate area under the normal curve. So this is the area to the left of the 16th week. The standard normal equation can be uh, applied as follows. So z equals your due day. It's uh, minus the expected date of completion divided by the project standard deviation, which means 16 weeks minus 15 weeks divided by 1.76 weeks, and that equals 0.57. Now, where Z is the number of uh, standard deviations, the due date or target date lies uh, from the mean or the expected date. So, referring to the normal table in Appendix 1 in the textbook, it's uh, alternatively using the Excel formula, we find the value, the Z value of 0.57 to the right of the mean indicates a probability of 16 weeks or less. And this is illustrated here in figure 3.13. And the shaded area to the left of the 16th week, which is 71.57%, represents the probability uh, that the project will be completed in less than 16 weeks. So let's say Julianne Williams is worried that there is only a 71.57% uh, chance that the pollution control equipment can be put into place in 16 weeks or less. Um, she thinks that it may be possible to plead with the board of directors for more time. However, before she approaches the board, she wants to arm herself with sufficient information about the project. So specifically, she wants to find the deadline by which she has a 99% chance of completing the project. So she hopes to use her analysis to convince the board to agree this extended deadline, even though she is aware of the public relations damage the delay will cause. So clearly, this due date would be greater than 16 weeks. However, what is the exact value of this new due date? That's the question. So to answer this question, we uh, again use the assumption that Milwaukee Papers project completion uh, completion time follows the normal probability distribution with a mean of 15 weeks and a standard deviation of 1.76 weeks. So Julie wants to find the due date that, given her uh, company's project a 99% chance of on-time completion. So she first needs to compute the Z value uh, corresponding to 99% as shown in figure 3.14. Mathematically this is similar to uh, example 10 except for um, the unknown is now the due date rather than Z.
Now, in referring again to the normal, oh, I'm going to go back a slide. Now, in referring again to the normal table in the Appendix One in the back of the textbook, uh, pages A2 and A3. That's the table. That's where, when you look in the text in the appendix area. Um, that's where they're located. Um, page A2 and A3. Uh, using the Excel formula, we identify a Z value of 2.33 as being closest to the probability of 0.99. That is, Julianne Williams' due date should be 2.33 standard deviations above the mean uh, project completion time. So starting with the standard normal equation, um, equation 3-9 from the textbook, uh, we can solve uh, for the due date and rewrite the equation as the due date equals the expected completion time plus the Z times the standard deviation, which translates to 15 weeks plus 2.33 times 1.76 equals 19.1 weeks. So if Williams can get the board to agree to give her a new deadline of 19.1 weeks or more, she could be 99% sure of finishing the project by the new target date. So in our discussion so far, we have focused exclusively on variability and the completion times of activities on the critical path. Now this seems logical because these activities are, by definition, the more important activities in a project network. However, when there is a variability in activity times, it is also important that we investigate the variability in the completion times of activities on the non-critical paths. And this slide summarizes the major uh, results from the ongoing Milwaukee paper example up to this point in the presentation. So uh, what has the project management uh, provided so far? The project's expected completion time is 15 weeks. There is a 71.57% uh, chance the equipment will be in place by the 16-week deadline. Uh, five activities, A, C, E, G, and H, are all on the critical path. And three activities, B, D, F, are not on the critical path and have some slack time. And a detailed schedule is available. So now we're going to talk about crashing. So crashing is shortening the activity time in a network to reduce time on the critical path. So total completion time is reduced. So in other words, crashing involves finding ways to shorten project activity times in order to speed up the overall project completion time. So why is this important? Well, construction projects in particular often carry huge penalties for each day late. So the cost of crashing or shortening an activity depends on the nature of the activity. Managers are usually interested in speeding up a project at uh, the least additional cost. Hence, uh, when choosing activities to crash and by how much, we need to ensure the following. First, the uh, amount by which an activity is crashed is, in fact, uh, permissible. Second, taken together, the shortened activity durations will enable us to finish the project by the due date. And third, the total cost of crashing is as small as possible. So crashing a uh, project involves four steps. The first uh, step is to compute the, uh, compute the crash cost per week or other time period for each activity in the network. If crash costs are linear over time, the formula illustrated on this slide can be used. Uh, crash cost per period equals crash cost minus normal cost divided by normal time minus crash time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so using the current activity times um, from the find the critical path in their project network and identify the critical activity. So that's um, step two. It's using the current activity times, find the critical path in the project network and identify the critical activities. Step three, if there is uh, only one critical path, then select the activity on this critical path that A, 
can still be crashed, and B has the smallest crash cost per period. Now, <coughs> crash this activity by one period. Um, if there is more than one critical path, then select one activity from each critical path such that A, each selected activity ca can still be crashed, and B, the total crash cost per period of all selected activities is the smallest. So uh, crash each activity by one period. It's important to note that uh, the same activity may be common to more than just one critical path. So you may have two critical paths <coughs> or more. Um, now moving on to the fourth step. I'm going to update all activity times. So if the desired due date has been reached, stop. If not, return to step two. It's really easy. And this slide shows how to crash the ongoing Milwaukee paper example by two weeks. Suppose the plant manager at Milwaukee Paper Manufacturing has been given only 13 weeks instead of 16 weeks to install the new pollution uh, control equipment, which is an excellent example here to use for you. Um, as you recall, the length of Julie Ann Williams' critical path was 15 weeks, but she must now complete the project in 13 weeks. So Williams needs to determine which activities to crash and by how much to meet this 13-week due date. So naturally, Williams is interested in speeding up the project by two weeks at the, uh, lead, uh, at the least additional cost. So <clears throat> the company's normal, uh, the company's normal uh, crash times and uh, normal and crash costs are depicted in table 3.5 on this slide. Okay, normal and crash times and normal and crash costs. Okay, um, so note, for example, that activity B's normal time is three weeks. The estimated used in computing the critical path and its crash time is one week. This means that activity B can be shortened by up to two weeks if the extra resources are provided. So the cost of these additional resources is $4,000, which essentially is the difference between the crash cost of $34,000 and the normal cost of $30,000. So if we assume that crashing cost is linear over time, that means the cost is the same each week, activity B's crash cost per week is $2,000, which was derived from taking the $4,000 and dividing it by two. So the current critical path using normal start times in start A, uh, from start to A, C, E, G, and H, all those activities, in which start is just a dummy, um, so that's a dummy starting activity. Um, of these critical activities, activity A has the lowest crash cost per week of $750. So Julianne Williams should therefore crash Activity A by one week to reduce the project completion time just to 14 weeks. So the cost is an additional $750, but note that Activity A cannot be crashed any further since it has reached its uh, crash limit of one week. Um, now, at this stage, the original um, path, which is start to A, to C, to E, to G, and H remains critical with a completion time of 14 weeks. However, a new start, uh, a new path start, B, start to B. All right, so the new path goes from start to B to D to G and H. That remains critical with a completion time of 14 weeks still. Hence, any further crashing must be done to both critical paths. Okay, because they're both equaling 14 at this point. So, one on each of the uh, critical paths, we need to identify one activity that can still be crashed. So, we also want the total cost of crashing an activity on each path to be the smallest. 
So we might be tempted to simply pick the activities with the smallest crash cost per period in each path. Now, if we did this, we would uh, select activity C from the first path and activity D from the second path. Now, the total crash cost will be $2,000, which, der which derives from adding the cost of each. Each one's $1,000. But now we spot, though, that activity G is common on both paths, which is pretty efficient. Um, if we crash G, we're taking care of both paths. So as by crashing G, we will simultaneously reduce the completion time of both paths, even though the $1,500 crash cost for activity G appears higher than that of uh, activity C and D, respectively. Um, we would still prefer crashing G because the total cost um, will be uh, only $1,500 compared to the $2,000. So when you look at the two uh, activities, uh, C and D, it was totaling $2,000. If you looked at them individually, they were um, $1,000, and then G would appear to be more. But that's not the case because we would have to crash both of them for the same amount of time. So it's much more efficient to crash G. Um, now, to crash the project down to 13 weeks, William should uh, crash activity A by one week and activity G by one week. So the total additional cost will be 2250 which derives from adding the $750 cost of A and the $1,500 cost of G. Now this is important because many contracts or projects uh, include bonuses for penalties uh, for early uh, early late and early start finishes. Um, so you, you want to know this. Also too in the risk management plan there may be um, you know monies for crashing um, you know a plan for crashing so uh, you know having a budget for crashing uh, you know you'll see that in not only the cost management plan but there may be references in your risk management plan. So as a critique of our uh, discussions of PERT, here are some of its features about which operations managers need to be aware. So first, it is especially useful when scheduling and controlling large projects. All right. um, second, it is straightforward. Uh, it's a straightforward concept and not mathematically complex. Uh, third, it's uh, graphical networks uh, help highlight relationships among project activities. And the fourth reason is the critical path and slack time analysis help pinpoint activities that need to be uh, closely watched. And the fifth feature is that managers need to be uh, awarded, uh, aware um, the project uh, documentation and graphs uh, point out, um, you know, the project documentation and graphics point out who is responsible for various activities. So project managers need to be aware of that. Um, and the sixth feature is the uh, PERT is applicable to a wide variety of projects. And the seventh and final feature is that PERT is useful in monitoring uh, not only schedules, but costs as well. And along with the great features, there are some limitations associated with Third, first project activities uh, have to be clearly defined and independent and stable in the relationship. Second, um, the precedence relationship must be specified and networked together. Third, time estimates tend to be subjective and are subject to fudging by managers. And finally, there is an inherent danger in placing too much emphasis uh, on the longest or critical path. So near critical tasks uh, need to be monitored closely as well. And this approach discusses the uh, so far the approaches discussed so far are effective for managing small projects. However, for large or complex projects, specialized project management software, as seen here, um, and this is Microsoft Project. I mentioned it earlier in the lecture. Um, this is highly preferred. And this slide just illustrates what a Gantt chart looks like using the uh, project management software. And Microsoft Project can schedule um, a project uh, 
in network format using the critical path as illustrated here on this slide. And this slide uh, you know, shows the monitoring capabilities of the software. After about six weeks, three activities, A, B, and C, have been completed, but three others, D, E, and F, are still behind schedule, as you see here. So software does a lot of the work for you, and it's essential if you're going to become a project manager. You get really good at using the software, very proficient. And this slide depicts an additional tracking mechanism associated with the software. Activity A, 100% completed, B, 100%, C, 100%, and so forth. So this concludes the Chapter 3 lecture. Please check all the expectations and deliverables associated with this chapter, and I will see you in Chapter 4.